have. So as the world has become more and more comfortable, it's not like we we go, oh my God, like things are amazing. I just have it so great. I'm safe. Like this is perfect. What a great time to be alive. We just sort of look for the next uh, problem or find the next thing that we think is unacceptable. Hi, this is Danae. I'm the founder of Simple Families. Simple Families is an online community for parents who are seeking a simpler, more intentional life. In this show, we focus on minimalism with kids, positive parenting, family wellness, and decreasing the mental load. My perspectives are based in my firsthand experience raising kids, but also rooted in my PhD in child development. So you're going to hear conversations that are based in research, but more importantly, real life. Thanks for joining us. Hi there, Danae here. Thanks so much for tuning in. I am recovering from a long-lasting case of laryngitis, which is why my voice sounds a little different than usual. Not ideal for a podcaster. Today, we are carrying over from last month's episode where we were talking about comfort. In this episode, I have an interview with Michael Easter, who is the author of the book, The Comfort Crisis. And I'll tell you that this has been a really thought-provoking topic and conversation for me, especially because this conversation comes at a time when our own discomforts, especially the discomforts I'm talking about in this episode today, pale in comparison to those across the world. In fact, I had a kid wake up the other morning for school and come downstairs and was lying on the sofa, pretty upset because the lights were on in the living room and insisting that I shut the lights off as they were curled up in a ball on the sofa. And typically, I probably would just flip the lights off so their eyes had time to adjust. But I thought twice before doing that and instead leaned into a little bit of this discomfort. If you listen back to the child anxiety episode with Ellie Leibowitz, That's simplefamilies.com forward slash episode 318. He talked to us about supportive statements. So that's what I used in this example. I said, I know it's uncomfortable, but I'm 100% positive that you can handle that light and your eyes will adjust. So offering a little bit of empathy and also some confidence that they can persevere. Giving our kids both small and big opportunities to cope with discomfort helps to build resilience. Michael and I are talking more about that today. Before we get into this episode, here's a one-minute word from today's sponsor, PrepDish. One of the most common misunderstandings I hear about PrepDish is people think that it's a food delivery service or a meal delivery service, but it's not. It's actually a meal planning service. So the only thing that you receive is a PDF in your inbox. You can't get much more zero waste than that. In that PDF, you'll receive meals for the week, including the most magical piece, which is the prep day list. So they provide you with a list of things that you can prep in advance to make dish day, the day that you serve the meal, so much faster and easier. So if you have felt bogged down by doing all the meal planning and all the meal prep, this is a great way to divide up the mental and the physical load because the whole process is broken down into parts for you. Try it out. Go to preptish.com forward slash families to get two weeks free. Again, that's preptish.com forward slash families. A few words about our guest today before we get started. Michael is a best-selling author, a professor, and an adventure traveler. In addition to the comfort crisis, he has another new book called The Scarcity Brain. I'll put the links to those in the show notes. Definitely check them both out. Without further ado, here's our conversation. Hi, Michael. How are you? I'm good. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for being here today. Yeah, it's good to it's good to be here for sure. I'm excited to talk. I haven't done a ton of parenting podcasts, but I get a lot of questions about parenting. So um, I guess I'm going to get an influx now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And we're not expecting you to be, be the expert because you don't have kids. Um, but I think you have a lot of really good insight that all of the listeners need to hear. Yeah, well, it's funny because I always say because I don't have kids, that either makes me a terrible person for parenting questions, or it makes me an excellent person for parenting questions because I don't have skin in the game, you know? Yeah, 
Um, so it's probably uh, a little bit of both, but well, I don't know. You guys can be the judge of that. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, whether or not you have kids, you still have an opinion about how the next generation is is coming up and the challenges that they're facing. Yeah. Um, so I first started thinking about comfort. I actually shared this story in a recent episode. Um, we got a car that has a built in like a thermostat on an app on my phone. So two years ago, we developed the ability to temperature control our car before we get into it. So on a hot day, we could cool it down and on a cool day, we could heat it up. So my kids never had a problem getting into my car before there was never any complaining. I mean, there's plenty of complaining about all the other things in life, but they never complained about getting into the car until I developed the ability to control the temperature. And all of a sudden they had a lot of opinions and a lot of complaints about the car not being 72 degrees upon entrance. And that was a real wake up call for me because I feel like how many other areas of our lives am I temperature controlling or am I controlling and making more comfortable for my kids to reduce the amount of whining? And that's kind of a little bit about what your book is about. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah. So my book is called The Comfort Crisis, and it basically looks at how as the world has become more comfortable in a lot of different ways. Some of the ways you just pointed out, we live at 72 degrees. Um, we often don't have to work physically for our food. Our world is safer in a, in a ton of different ways, um, on and on and on. While that's good because it's a result of progress, that also comes with downsides. Because generally, the things that keep humans happy and healthy, you often have to go through some form of discomfort to get them. For example, you know, if you want to improve your health, you're going to have to exercise. Exercise is uncomfortable. If you wanted to lose weight, you might have to eat less and you're going to be hungry and hunger is no fun. If you even wanted to improve your mental health, that's not always a super easy thing to do, right? You might have to have some hard conversations and ask yourself some hard questions. But on the other side of that is uh, growth. And so the book really looks at what are the most important forms of discomfort that we as humans have lost due to progress? And how can we put them back into our life in a intelligent way, right? The point isn't just, oh, go do anything to get uncomfortable. Like, no, it's uh, there's certain things that tend to move the dial. Hmm. Yeah. And in your book, you talk a lot about physical discomfort. Can you talk a little bit about the connection between physical discomfort and mental health? Yeah, well, I think that you do see there's a pretty strong correlation between physical activity and mental health. And there's probably a variety of, of reasons for that. Um, but I do also think that um, the physical is often a way to get to the mental because when you physically accomplish something, I think that it gives people a sort of wind in their sails and helps them realize that they are perhaps more capable than they thought. So a, a classic example that kind of tracks back to parenting here that we don't have anymore would be like a traditional rite of passage. So in all societies across the world for most of time, um, young people were put through a nature-based uh, physical rite of passage. All right. And so the idea is that we are going, we have this person who's at point A in their life and we need to get them to point B. Point B is where they're more confident, they're more capable, they're a better contributor to our group of people. Now, what do we do to get them to this point B? We would often send them out into nature to do something that was challenging because along the way, they're going to struggle. They're going to have doubts. They're going to have to overcome a lot of things. And in the process of that overcoming, they go, oh, I am more capable than I thought. And then they can return back and be better for us all, a better member of society. Yeah. You talked a little bit about the Dutch tradition of dropping in your book. What is, tell us, is that exactly what you just said? Tell us about that. Does that still go on? Yeah, that's still, that still goes on. So that's one where it's taking the same concepts of these old rites of passages and it's putting it um, to scale today in a modern context. And basically what the Dutch do is they just like drop their kids in the woods and go, all right, try and find your way home. Uh, and they do this at night and the story of all of these is like I just said, it's that when a person is out in this sort of middle ground that's removed from their comfortable life and struggling, they have to face doubts, they have to overcome things, they have to do all these things that in the process of overcoming them, teaches them something about themselves. Now, these kids aren't getting any fitter from just one night in the woods. But what is happening is that they're changing um, psychologically and learning something about themselves and what they are capable of. And then that in turn can be transferred over to all different experiences they have in life. 
Yeah. I, um, this summer, my, one of my kids spent a week at their grandparents' house by themselves. And this was the first time because all the grandparents live out of state. So logistically getting them there and leaving them there requires us to then go back and pick them up. So it's kind of complicated. So this was the first time that we have executed this. So my husband took my kid there, dropped them off at the grandparents and then came home. And then a week later we went to pick the child up and kid had a great week, amazing week. I saw lots of pictures, lots of smiling, lots of happiness. But then we went to do the pickup. The child was pretty distraught and pretty upset. Um, Actually really relieved to see me, very emotional to see me after a week of being away, but actually said to my husband, how could you leave me here? How could you do this to me? (laughs) Which was really really surprising. Um, And I think that at that strong, really strong reaction, even for days later, still pretty upset about being left, like essentially being dropped, but not in the woods at grandparents' house, much safer, much more enjoyable atmosphere. But, you know, as a therapist, my mind goes to, I think that maybe I traumatized this kid a little bit by dropping him at his grandparents' house. Um, But it's so important, right? Like reaffirm that for me, right? Like even though there's in, in therapy, we talk about big T traumas and little T traumas, little T trauma, big T traumas are like car accidents and um, witnessing a, a terrible crime. Little T are like little things that upset you as life goes on. And I definitely think there was a little T trauma that came out of this, but it feels important. Yeah. Yeah. Um, to your point about how you earlier, how your kids now, you know, insist on having the vehicle at 72 degrees. I think that uh, when you look at a lot of research on what the human brain does is that it adapts, we adapt to our circumstances. And so there's this concept in the book that I talk about that's called prevalence induced concept change. And it was discovered by these two Harvard psychologists in 2018. But the long story short of it is that um, we tend to look for problems, no matter how many problems we have in the grand scheme of time and space. And this applies to how we relate to comfort. So, you know, today's comfort is tomorrow's discomfort as we advance over time. So as the world has become more and more comfortable, it's not like we we go, oh my God, like things are amazing. I just have it so great. I'm safe. Like this is perfect. What a great time to be alive. We just sort of look for the next uh, problem or find the next thing that we think is unacceptable to the point of your yeah. kids kind of moving the goalpost. And so I think when you put this in the context of today where things are in the grand scheme of time and space, like really good, like really good as the goalpost shifts, you can still have the little T traumas for things that in the past would have just been normal life. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. Um, and so I don't, you know, that, that's what, that's what we do as a species, but at the same time, I don't think it's always a good thing because it can lead us to lack some perspective and potentially be less resilient. Yeah, absolutely. And so going through that, what kind of what you were saying, going through that, I think is, is good because, you know, your, your kid probably realizes, yeah, they survived it. They made it out. Like next time they have to do that, which is by the way, it's going to happen. Like that's what happens in life. Um, they're going to have a little more room to be able to deal with that. Yeah. I was fascinated by this idea of prevalence induced concept change, which I think the name is kind of intimidating, but the way that you described it as the researchers were finding that unethical research proposals were decreasing. So people weren't coming with this proposal to like, let's leave kids in the woods for a week alone, right? They're not proposing things that are like wildly unethical. So then the committee started rejecting the ethics committee started rejecting proposals based on ambiguous reasons, just like on random things that wouldn't have previously been rejected because they just, the, the, like you said, the goalpost moved, which is so fascinating. Yeah, exactly. So it was two different studies they did. And they first, they first got this idea because they were waiting in line for TSA and they realized that, you know, TSA is really good at finding problems. (laughs) And if all of a sudden everyone obey the rules, they're like, I wonder if the TSA would just let everyone go through TSA. And they're like, yeah, "Yeah, I don't think they would. I think they would just widen what they consider a problem. So they do two different studies to look at this. And then the first they had people look at a group of people look at 800 different faces and they had to deem whether the faces were threatening or unthreatening. And the catch is that after the 200th face, they start showing these people fewer and fewer threatening faces. 
The other one, uh, to your point about the research proposals, was the same deal. They had these people had to read research proposals and deem whether they were ethical or unethical. But again, at some point, they start giving them fewer and fewer unethical proposals. So these things, they should be pretty black or white, right? It's like you see someone and you find them threatening, or you read this research proposal and it crosses this like moral line that you have in the sand, or it does not cross the line. Uh, but what they found is that we actually see gray. So as people saw fewer and fewer objectively threatening faces, they didn't say threatening any fewer times. They started deeming faces that were kind of ambiguous as threatening and same with the research proposals. And that sort of transfers over to this larger idea about how we judge our circumstances based on all the examples that have come before. Hmm. I wrote this quote down from your book. You said, as we experience fewer problems, we don't become more satisfied. We just lower our threshold for what we consider a problem. We end up with the same number of troubles, but our new problems are progressively more hollow. That um, rings so true, I think. And you called it scientific evidence for first world problems, which is, yeah, it's it's a new lens for me to think about this through um, as to why this really happens. Yeah, and I mean you see it, right? It's, uh, you see it. It's like, we have all these things in yeah. our life now that we're just like, oh my God, I could never live without that. But you know, 15 years ago, we lived just fine without them. And yeah. 15 years before that, and 15 years before that, and 150 years before that. And, you know, it's, uh, it's just what we do. And again, um, when you apply that to parenting, I think it, the answer to me, because I'm not just thinking about it from a kid's perspective, but I'm thinking about it as a human's perspective. And you know, kids are unique, but also at the end of the day, they're human. So let's like treat them as humans, you know, you need to have a wide range of experiences in your life and do things that aren't always easy and try and find ways that try and find ways to get out of your comfort zone that show you a new perspective of living that show you that you can't overcome challenges and difficulties in your life. Because if you don't do that, and you know, by the time you hit 25, the first time you actually hit a challenge, you're going to be like, well, what the hell is this? And how the hell do I, what do I do with this? And you're going to crack up. And that's probably not a good thing. Yeah. And you're going to call your mom. Yeah. Right. You're going to call mom, <laughs> mom. What do I do? <laughs> yeah. Um, I, you also wrote, I highlighted this, you said preventing kids from exploring their edges is largely thought to be a cause of the abnormal and growing rates of anxiety in young people. Mm -hmm. which um, I, I think is also true. Um, and it's, you know, I think it, when, when reading your book, you really went deep on a lot of the physical aspects of discomfort. I think as parents, we find ourselves um, for sure, not wanting our kids to get physically uncomfortable, but I think the mental discomfort, right. Not wanting our kids to get picked on by other kids, not wanting our kids to complain or dislike the food that we're cooking. So we cook them something else, but we, I think can go to great lengths to avoid our kids getting uncomfortable because at its core, it makes us uncomfortable, right? Yeah. Like we have to listen to the complaining. We, it leads us to feeling like we aren't doing our jobs if our kids are unhappy. So I think that, you know, it really kind of does circle back to us in that one of the reasons that we avoid letting our kids get uncomfortable is because it, I, I'll speak for myself. It's very uncomfortable for me. Yeah, it's uh, more work. And I probably also there's societal pressures. You know, if you're the parent who, you know, my mom, my mom's approach on parenting when I was a kid was, all right, be home when the streetlights come on. Right. And I think that was the norm for a long time. And I don't think that's the norm anymore. In fact, I think you get the cops called on you if that's what yeah. you do. And I don't think that's a good thing because I mean, for your example of bullying, it's like when I'm out as a kid, just kind of exploring and meeting other kids and, you know, we got our gang of kids and we meet this other gang of kids and like, yeah, we kind of go back and forth bullying each other, but you're also learning a lot in that process. Right. I learn where a, where a boundary is. If I say this to this kid and he punches me in the face, it's like, well, that's a good learning experience of like what not to say. And yeah, that was tough in the short term, but I learned a lot from that, you know? And so I think that by not letting kids have maybe more room to go out in the world uh, with other kids and have these interactions that just would have naturally arisen in the past that are effectively learning experiences, that might have some consequences over the long term. And I'm a professor too. So, I mean, I definitely have seen changes in even how we talk about ideas in the classroom and what people are uh, 
willing to talk about. And it's a, it's a tough line to toe, but you know, my approach has always been that, um, shedding light on different ideas is probably the best antiseptic for bad ideas. Mm -hmm. You know, so if you, if you can't talk about anything, that's probably a, a, a bad trajectory as well. Yeah. You talk in the book about um, a group of college students going on a camping trip and realizing that they didn't have cell phone reception. Um, And you compared it to the stages of grief, which I thought was fascinating. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So this is, there's a section on my book about how um, the benefits of nature, basically the mental health specifically benefits of, of nature. And the research is really fascinating. Now I will say that initially when I started, um, thinking about this, I was like, yeah, this is some hippie stuff. This is whatever. But um, the research is growing. It's really strong. You basically find that when humans spend time in nature, different types of nature, different lengths, um, a lot of good things happen, especially for mental health and focus and creativity and reductions in stress. And as part of, uh, I spoke to this researcher whose name is Rachel Hopman, and she conducted this study where they took a group of college students into the backcountry of Utah for, I think it was four or five days. And they basically just wanted to see how, um, how their mental health and, and brains change. So they literally brought these like scanners with them to put on the kids. But what, what she said was so interesting is that they deliberately picked a place where they couldn't get cell reception. Because there is research indicating that if you are on your cell phone while you are outside, you're not getting a lot of the benefits because your focus is still like inside and you're Mm -hmm. not focused on the outdoors. And what she found is that these kids at first, they kind of freaked out by not having their cell phone. It was like, oh my God, this is terrible. You know, and then it was like, we got to go hike somewhere where we can get a cell reception. And what am I going to do with this? It was like literally the five stages of grief. And then finally, at the end, after three days, we're like, you know what? This nature stuff is actually not so bad. I feel pretty good. I feel pretty calm. I feel pretty collected. And this tracks back to this idea that researchers are working on called the three day effect. And it basically states that three days in the back country without your cell phone does really great things for our mental health, for calmness, for clarity. And it doesn't just wash off when you get back to the regular world. So there's actually a lot of research now on veterans who have PTSD and using extended time in nature as a way to help them. Mm. So that third day is when the benefits start to kick in. And if you have those benefits, then those benefits tend to be lasting. Yeah, they tend to last at least a couple of weeks, a few weeks, according to some studies. So there, there's kind of this idea I talk about it in the book called the nature pyramid. And you can think about it like the food pyramid. But instead of saying, you know, eat this many servings of wheat and this many of vegetables, basically it tells you how much time you should spend in different types of nature, at how often. So um, and you can read about it all in the book. But um, yeah, basically, it kind of gives you a framework from over the weeks, months, and years for how to get an effective dose of nature that will give you mental health benefits. And I think this is really powerful for kids too, because nature is a great, um, is a great teacher as well. Yeah. And it's getting harder and harder to get kids outside, to make time to get kids outside with kids having busier schedules. Um, something that I'm seeing more and more as a therapist, as the clients that I'm working with, the parents are, essentially keeping the kids in more structured activities to create more structure around screen time, because otherwise the kids come home and they just want to be on their screens all the time. So instead they enroll them in a lot of after school activities and that um, keeps them essentially busy. So they're not begging for and not reaching for their screens all the time. Um, But there are very few activities that are, well, almost no activities that provide unstructured time in nature. Um, But other than, you know, outdoor sports, I think, which here in New York are limited to when the weather is good. um, Most most kids are not getting outside when, you know, it's rainy or a little bit undesirable. Like there's no recess if it's trickling anymore. Yeah. Well, I mean, neither are parents in fairness yeah. to the kids. <laughs> so the average person today spends 93% of their time indoors. Wow. And when you think about that change, humans evolved in the outdoors. We were outdoorsy in the sense that we spent every waking moment outside. <laughs> and that changed, uh, that changed us. We're adapted to be outside in those environments and we no longer are. And so I think that there is a pretty strong case for 
trying to get kids and parents and everyone outside more. We're going to pause for two minutes to hear from our sponsors. The first sponsor is Masterclass. I have been a longtime fan of Masterclass. A few years ago, I was interested in learning more about poetry, and I had no idea where to start. So I chose to start with Billy Collins' Poetry Masterclass, and I found it such an engaging way to learn about something that I was clueless about, but curious about. All the Masterclass programs have amazing high-quality video, but you also have the option to listen in audio mode. So if you like to listen, which maybe you do since you're listening to this podcast right now, this might be a great option for you. Memberships start at $120 a year for unlimited access to all the classes with over 180 Masterclass instructors. And right now, our listeners are going to get an additional 15% off an annual membership at masterclass.com slash families. Get 15% off right now at masterclass.com slash families. That's masterclass.com slash families. Our next sponsor for today is KiwiCo. The holiday seasons are upon us and your kids can unwrap inspiration with super fun science, technology, and art projects for kids. KiwiCo now has nine different subscription options for different ages, subjects, and interests. I'm really excited to surprise my kids with the KiwiCo advent calendar this year. The advent calendars have several different levels of complexity and I know my kids are gonna love it. Perhaps the thing that I like most about KiwiCo is that it offers rich activities for all ages and interests. It engages both the child and the parent alike to provide us with opportunities to do things that are interesting for all of us. So discover hands-on fun with KiwiCo. Get your first month free on any crate line at kiwico.com slash simple. That's your first month free at kiwico.com slash simple. Thanks for supporting our sponsors. Back to my chat with Michael. Can you tell us about Masogi's? Yeah. So this is, <laughs> this is this idea I learned about from a guy whose name is Marcus Elliott. And he is a, he was a Harvard MD. So he graduates from Harvard, gets his medical degree there. And he decides he doesn't want to be a doctor. He wants to revolutionize sports science. And this is kind of one of those claims where you go, okay, whatever, dude. Uh, but he actually does it. So he's the first person to put like big data uh, and AI uh, tracking player movement patterns, and he can predict injuries. Now, to bring it back to this Masogi idea is that his whole thing of improving pe- humans at his core business is all about numbers and data and figures. But he realizes that what really improves athletes and humans, it's usually not something physical, it's mental, it's a psychological shift. And so how do you get to that? And it kind of goes back to what I was saying about rites of passage. So what this guy does is once a year, he will take a group of, could be some athletes with him. It could be regular people who are just his friends and they'll go out into nature and they'll do something really, really hard. So the two rules of Masogi are one, make it really hard, which they define by saying you should have a 50, 50 shot at finishing whatever this Masogi task you've taken on in nature is. And then two, don't die which is basically just a tongue in cheek way of saying, be safe. Um, But what happens is that as you do some really challenging thing in nature, and it could be like, okay, we're going to pick the farthest mountain we can see, and we're going to see if we can make it there in a day. What tends to happen is that people face these moments where they think they have to quit if it's challenging enough, right? They're like, I can't go on any further. But if they can just keep putting one foot in front of the other, they get another moment. And that's where they realize well, I thought my edge was back there, but I'm obviously past it. And that leads to the next question, which is, okay, sold myself short there. So where else in my life am I selling myself short? And once you can take that back into your normal life, that changes you. And when you think about humans of the past, it's like we had to do hard things in nature all the time. I mean, it was a life or death. You had you got thrust into these scenarios that were physical, mental, even spiritual. Could be a big hunt. It could be from moving to summer into wintering grounds. And each time we took on one of these big challenges in nature, we would learn something about ourselves and our capabilities, right? We would grow as humans. Now, we don't really have those anymore. So the idea is that how can we find ways to put these um, 
really important experiences that humans faced and grew from for millions of years back into modern life. And because we don't have, we don't live like that anymore, where we have to hunt for our own food and gather our own food and, and take care of ourselves outdoors on a daily basis. We have a lot of extra time on our hands since all these things are done for us, right? That used to be the way thousands of years ago. That's how people spent their days and their time. And now we don't. So now we have all this time. And of course we're working and, you know, taking care of families, but now we fear boredom more than ever. And we spend all of that, all of our free moments pretty much on some sort of device or media. Most of us, you talk a lot about boredom and devices in your book. Um, and is that something that you, even though you know better, you still continue to struggle with? Well, I think we all do because yeah. So the, the crazy stat from the book is that, and is the average person today spends, more than 12 hours and 20 minutes engaged with digital media. Now, when I wrote the book, it was 11 hours and six minutes, but we've since the publishing of the book, which was two years ago, we've added another hour and whatever the math is, 14 minutes onto um, time on digital media. So that's from TVs, that's from cell phones, that's from iPads, that's from computers, that's from on and on and on and on, right? All of this stuff is new in the grand scheme of time and space. We literally didn't have any of it up until a hundred years ago. And now it's basically become our lives. And that's very much changed how we live as a species. And I think one of the, the things is that we often use them to kill boredom, right? So in the past, when you were bored, you often have had to figure out a creative outlet for your boredom. But today we sort of just have this easy effortless escape from it. So boredom Boredom evolved to basically tell humans that whatever you're doing with your time right now, the return on your time invested has worn thin. So let's say that you and I, um, it's a million years ago, we're hunting, we need food to survive. And we're sitting on this hill and we're waiting for animals to come through and there's no animals coming through. So boredom would basically kick on and say, all right, like this isn't working. So you got to go find something else to do with your time. So in the past, we do something productive. We might go pick fruit. We might pick potatoes. We might, we do something that enhanced our lives. But now when we feel boredom, we have a very easy, effortless escape from it in the, in the form of cell phones or TVs or whatever it might be. And I think that this has changed us in a lot of ways and changed how we spend our time and not always in a good way. So part of my message in the book is that, you know, a lot of focus gets put on cell phones which as it probably should in a way, but the issue is that when people realize, realize they spend too much time on their smartphone and they go, okay, I'm going to spend less time. And they take an hour off their phone screen time. What happens is that they then get bored and they go, okay, well, I guess I'll just watch Netflix. And that is the same damn thing. Like it's all the same, right? So my, uh, my message in the book is, thinking about how can we find ways to add more boredom into our lives? Because I think there are upsides to boredom in terms of creativity, in terms of mental health, in terms of just having to put yourself through a little bit of that discomfort and see where it leads you other than a screen. Yeah. Yeah. And you write um, that the media has created Americans who are increasingly picky, impatient, distracted, and demanding. And I thought that was particularly interesting because I feel like so often, especially I'm not just our kids, all of us, our media use is really on demand, right? We can on demand pull up anything that is particularly relevant to our specific interests at that very moment, right? So like if it's you're shopping for a new belt, right? All of a sudden you're being infiltrated with belt ads. You know, I find that often my phone reads my mind and predicts what I might be thinking of next because it knows me so well. So that fact that it's spoon fed to us, our interests are constantly spoon fed to us, leads us to demand exactly what we want when we want it all the time. And our kids have only ever grown up with that, right? You know, my kids, when they watch TV, I make them take turns picking shows. So they have to tolerate watching the other person's show. And even though it's screen time, I feel like it is really well time well spent (laughs) because Mm -hmm. they just have to sit watching something that they don't hate, but it wouldn't be the thing that they would pick. 
And that sort of opportunity doesn't present itself nearly as often as it did 20 or 30 years ago. Yeah, totally. And I think, um, so my next book, uh, which is, which just came out, is called the scarcity, scarcity brain. And it goes into why we get sort of hooked on these repeat habits and, uh, in terms of scrolling in terms of binge watching in terms of even, um, eating and it all, it tracks back to this, uh, behavior loop that I read about in the book that's called the scarcity loop. And it evolved to keep humans alive and help us persist in hard searches for food in the past, but it's now sort of being co-opted by a lot of different industries and put into all sorts of different products to get us to consume more than we would want. So if, yeah, if you, people are interested in that angle, that's a different book to check out. Yeah. In the comfort crisis, you talk a lot about your, do you call it back country, um, back country hunting? What is it? The experience, the general name of the experience for your trip to Alaska? Yeah. yeah I think you could call it that. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I was telling my husband about this because it's something he would love or like would, would, would dream of, but not be able to execute because now he has kids and responsibility. <laughs> like mm-hmm. not to say that you don't, but like, do you think that like, if he ever came to me and said, I want to go spend a month living in the Arctic off the land and hunting caribou, I would just, I would, I don't know what I, I don't know how I would react, but I think that when I, when you read that, when I read your book, I don't want people, when, if they read it, I don't want them to think like, oh, this is like, this is so extreme. Cause there are, there are much smaller opportunities to get uncomfortable. Um, but do you think, or hear from other parents who are sort of like, well, now that I have kids, I can't do these things that I'd like to do, or I have other obligations, that sort of thing. Uh, yeah, I definitely do. And yeah, to your point about the book, it's the, the trip to the Arctic is sort of the overarching narrative that allows me to get into these points that are relevant to everyone's life, no matter who you are. Um, it's just that the Arctic provides a good story and a good setting yeah. to talk about those. <laughs> um, but to the point about parents, yeah, I think that um, a lot of people who have kids today feel like they have to be there every single waking moment. And, you know, I think that especially if you're co-parenting, you have a, you have two parents. Um, I think that sometimes it might be important for you to take time for yourself and go do these things because especially if they're going to improve you in the long run, Mm -hmm. like, yeah, you might be there every waking moment, but if you would have taken these kind of two weeks and, you know, maybe it was challenging for you, it was challenging for your, um, the other parent, but you come back that much better. Like to me, that's probably a win. And the reason, one of the reasons that I'm slightly skeptical that you can't be away from kids for, you know, two days is because I was raised by a single uh, parent who had to travel for work. And first of all, like being a single mom in the United States, like that is a bad hand to get. And so my mom realized that and she started her own business that involved a lot of traveling across the Mountain West. And she was probably gone about a third of the year, Hmm. but she figured it out. She got me different nannies. She got people to watch me. Um, And I think we're way closer because of that, because we had to have time apart. And for me personally, like, I know that it was hard for me at times as a kid, but I also learned so much from that because I would have a different nanny every like year or two because she would hire usually college students. And because of that, I learned how to interact with and live with different types of people. Mm -hmm. Like, it's just this cast of people that I had to be like, all right, you got to figure it out, you know? And it's like, okay, you know, a nanny may not know how to make mashed potatoes. So I'd be like, as an eight year old, all right, we got to figure out how the hell to make mashed potatoes. And I figured it out. Like I learned a lot of skills from that. And so I do think that maybe we've overcorrected in such a way of being like, Oh, you can't leave your kids for two seconds. You know? Um, I'm not saying it's going to be easy. I'm not saying, yeah, just like, you know, take, take your eight years in Tibet or whatever that movie is. Like, I'm not saying that at all, but I am saying that, um, taking a couple of weeks, if you think it's going to benefit your life and your kid's life in the long run, doesn't seem to me like a bad deal. Mm, Yeah. My husband's going to like that advice. (laughs) (laughs) I think I could get on board with it too. Um, I think that the danger factor always wears on me and even more now that we're parents, maybe, um, I mean, he did a lot of dangerous things and I would consider your trip to the Arctic dangerous. I don't know what your wife thought, uh, <laughs> but I, I think that he did a lot of dangerous things pre-kids, but I try to 
to um, push him towards doing safer ventures now. Mm-hmm. Um, how does your wife feel about your trip to the Arctic and other uh, other of your adventures? Oh, I, I was in the Arctic freezing my butt off, starving because you can only bring in so much food, just totally exhausted. And she went on a, a cruise into the Mediterranean with my mom and just totally <laughs> trolled me with that. So uh, she had a good time. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, she she realizes like you're, you know, she looks at me and goes, well, I married you because you're not an idiot. I know that you're going to do everything you can to make this safe. Yeah. And yeah, it is some of the things I do for work are inherently unsafe, but they're safer than they ever have been. Like we've got a GPS locator, we've got X, Y, Z, like sure stuff happens, but the, but the probability of something happening, unless you're a total moron, which that's also hard to do because like Google's a thing, like look and see what you need to do to be safe. I think is much lower too. Yeah. Well, and that safety piece feels important because I think that, and you talk about this in the book is that, you know, we have these safety alarms that go off when we're not unsafe, right? Like if we've been running for two miles and we feel like we're going to die, like we're not actually going to die. Even if those, even if mentally you have alarm bells going off, like I might die if I go five more steps, but rarely is that the case, right? Yeah. And that evolved to keep us uh, alive. So in the past, it never made sense to expend extra effort if you didn't have to. Um, It made sense to overcorrect on safety because the world actually was very unsafe back then. Uh, But we still have that sort of ancient hardware that overcorrects Mm -hmm. in the form of don't move too much, be as safe as possible. Oh, and by the way, if you find food, like you should definitely eat more of it than you actually need. All these things, um, they work against us today. So this is what anthropologists would call an evolutionary mismatch, where these drives that evolved over this long time span in one environment, um, they don't make sense in our new modern environments, which are very, very, very different than those that we evolved in. Yeah, that's fascinating. Well, thank you so much, Michael. I would love to have you on again and chat with you about your new book. Um, Congratulations on that. It's only been out a couple of weeks, right? Yeah, it came uh, a week today. So yeah, great. Cool. Yeah. I'd love to come back on. I really enjoyed the conversation. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks so much for tuning in. This has been episode 360 of Simple Families. I hope you enjoyed my chat with today's guest, Michael Easter. If you want to find the links to get in touch with him or for his books, go to the show notes. I look forward to chatting with you all next month. Have a good one.